All righty, everybody. How is everybody doing? Great to see you guys. Thank you for joining us at our at our March uh, monthly program. As always, we have a few things to uh, to take care of before we can get on to the main event. Uh, first and foremost, I want to have a quick recap on our recent Native Plant Day, which happened uh, just uh, a couple Saturdays ago now. Um, I hope uh, you guys enjoyed the events. You know, it was a really lively one over at 80, 80 uh, Barnes Park. We really lucked out because it was clear skies the entire day. And then the following weekend, we got all that torrential downpour. So, and usually we have it on March 20 something. This time we, we kind of changed course and, and had it mid-March on, on the 16th. So uh, pa Patty Fair said it was the luck of the Irish for St. Patty's Day uh, 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 weekend. So. It was a it was a great great turnout you know great great day a lot of great conversations and and uh, and, and just lively uh, enjoyment of native plants and all the benefits that they have and you know it was really really great to see everybody there um, of course with so many things within an event like Native Plant Day it it doesn't happen in a vacuum and it certainly isn't done by any one person uh, so I just wanted to take a uh, a quick moment to give uh, thanks to to everybody who helped put it together. Uh, we got input from the entire uh, uh, DCFMPS board. Um, I did wanna give a very special thank you to, to Jeannie. Jeannie was one of my right-hand people in setting things together, reaching out to folks, putting the presentations together, helping with the organization. So thank, thank you very much, Jeannie. Um, I also wanna give thanks to all the volunteers. You know, With Native Plant Day, there's so many moving parts. You know, I'm, if you saw me, I was all over the place. I wasn't in any one spot for more than a minute. Uh, and I can't be everywhere. So having all the volunteers help uh, was, was, was really great. And we, we, can't, we can't do anything with, without uh, folks, folks having to help out. I also wanted to give a special thanks to, to Patty, who was another right-hand person uh, with organization, reaching out to folks and making sure everything was running uh, smoothly. Uh, to Raul, Raul brought in a lot of, uh, uh, of plants to, to, the, uh, to the event. Um, and I also wanna give another special thanks to Maria, sorry if I butchered the last name, Botegui, uh, who made a very great um, uh, program for the kids, which was really great. You know, there was a lot more kind of tactile activities for them to, to have, which was, which was awesome. Uh, a general thanks to all the exhibitors, all listed here. Uh, who, who, uh, who attended, uh, thanks to all the presenters and walk leaders and to the, uh, the plant vendors who attended. Uh, I also wanna give a special uh, thanks and acknowledgement to the staff at AD Barnes Park and at Eco Adventures. They were super accommodating with, uh, with the events and they were very helpful, you know, just doing a lot of very small things to make sure everything ran smoothly. So having, having them on our side was, was, uh, was, was really helpful in getting things going. And then finally to Crate Maker for supplying food. I hope you guys all enjoy it. All right. So there's just a couple of things uh, coming up to, uh, to save the date for. Um, first and foremost, on Sunday, April 14th, there is going to be a yard visit at Pinecrest. Uh, more info upcoming. I'm not sure myself the details of the, uh, of the event, uh, but there should be more in the upcoming new newsletter as well as the, uh, the calendar. So keep checking 
uh, keep checking back on that. Um, our next monthly meeting is gonna be held on Tuesday, April 23rd. It's gonna be held, like, as, as always, here at Pinecrest Gardens, and it's gonna be titled Prioritizing Native Florida Plants in the Urban Food Forest and delivered by Dr. Kara Rockwell from, uh, from FRU. Um, we do have an upcoming election before you know it. On our annual meeting on May 28th, we're gonna have our board uh, uh, elections. So between now and then, we are accepting uh, nominations for the positions that are coming up. Uh, open positions are president, vice president, and we have several directors at large. So if you're interested in joining the, uh, the chapter and you, you'd like to contribute and, and you wanna help kind of, uh, kind of push, you know, how the, the direction that the chapter is going and, and different, uh, different events and activities that we host, you can feel free to reach out to, to, uh, to me. Uh, my email is there, uh, briandiaz1210 at gmail.com. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to welcome our new members. We have Adrian Alvarez, Stephen Barturin, Beth Belligan, Sandra Brand, Les Leslie Perez, Donna Torres, Annabelle Valdez, Danilo Castro, and Andres Vila. Any of those folks joining us tonight? New members? If you are a new member, you do get uh, some perks, including uh, free, free uh, raffle tickets. So if you're not a member and you're interested, uh, I highly encourage you guys to join. There's a lot more information than what's on this slide on the newsletter, so definitely refer to it uh, to get a more comprehensive uh, you know, view of, of upcoming events. I uh, want to give a quick thank you to everyone who donated plants at today's raffle table. Some pretty neat stuff that we have today. Um, and just a little bit of housekeeping. If you, uh, if you have a cell phone, just kindly silence uh, or, or turn it off, just out of courtesy to our speaker. Now for the folks joining us on YouTube, we're gonna take a few moments to present the uh, raffle plants. I know you guys can't see it, but you guys can at least hear about some of the plants we have here today. Thank you, Thank you Brian. Okay, uh, one, one housekeeping announcement. December, January, I brought in a fern that was growing on a sable palm that I thought was the Phlebodium arium, the, 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 uh, the golden polypity fern. Turns out it was one of the invasive unhappy ferns. And I will be happy because I do have the Phlebodium arium. If any of you got that, this is two months ago, three months ago, let me know. I will be happy, happy, happy to supply you with, with the legitimate thing and my apologies. So starting here. Yeah, uh, we'll go. Um, a live oak, uh, moderately fast growing tree, probably if you had to have birds, that probably would be it. Um, Simpson stopper looks nice. And there may be more than one, but there's, uh, these, these grow moderately, not fast growing, but they're beautiful, beautiful uh, shrubs and small trees. A beauty berry that looks pretty healthy. Um, these six plants here are for the raffle, but they are also the plants that are available now on the East store. There's a couple more species, but I didn't bring them, but these are available. This is silver aster that's just come into, into uh, the inventory. Um, Symphytricum concolor, Beautiful spikes, typically in the autumn, bluish, purplish, pinkish color. Uh, St. Andrew's cross. I don't know that it's a butterfly host plant, but it is a big butterfly attractor. Uh, this is a uh, scale leaf or clasping aster, Symphytricum hypnotum, uh, also a pretty uh, autumn flower. This is a Pineland beggar ticks or uh, tick trefoil, Desmodium marylandicum. It, it really has little to recommend it except it looks cute. Um, this is swamp milkweed, wet plant, uh, three feet tall, beautiful flowers, attracts everything, butterfly-ish. Uh, common partridge pea, it's all curled up for the night. Uh, also a nice, this is actually the host plant for at least two butterflies that I can think of. Um, sort of hesitant about this. This is, this is bushy blue, you know, from the canals, and, uh, and, and it is a native anthropogen but it is extremely, extremely robust. It will grow three or four feet tall in the autumn. It has just huge bushy heads of, of, of flowers and, uh, and seeds. Um, this is our dandelion, the white sunbonnet, Chaptalia albicans. 
um, Pineland plant. This is a this is a bloodberry. Yeah, this is uh, a great butterfly attracted as well. Back here we have a blue porter weed. We have a host of what I think are um, Coryopsis leavenworthy uh, tick seed. Uh, very beautiful plants. Now they're blooming in my yard anyway, really nicely. Uh, this looks like Salvia coccinea, the scarlet sage. Next to it is Salvia lorata, the blue sage, the lyre leaf sage. Um, a bunch of pepper weeds, which are the host of, help me out again, Giselle, which butterfly? Okay, so checkered the checkered white, the cabbage white, and the great southern white occasionally, right? Florida cinchweed, great, uh, at least my experience, nice ground cover. Um, I think this is a ficus aureus, a strangler fig. Um, three very nice looking uh, Havana skull caps, a nice looking locust berry. Thank you. A wild coffee, small but promising. Um, this is Simaruba, right? This is paradise tree. And then a, a bunch of stoppers that I, I am not competent enough to tell you which is which. We're, we, were, we were saying that this is spicewood or yeah, myrtle of the river. Like a, a, One of the two. The yeah, well, they're, they're both calyptranthes, but I don't know. I can't tell you which is which. This stopper, they're definitely all stoppers. This is Spanish stopper. This is a Florida privet, not a stopper. Two... Um, Fire bushes, hamelias, another stop for two very nice looking stoppers. These are, these are all handsome trees when they get established. And that's it. Thank you very much. All right. Before we get to our main event, on the off chance that the person who left this at uh, Native Plant Day is here. So someone left a Bonanza shirt, a Pine Rockland guide, and one of these uh, kind of DIY uh, birdhouses. The person who won all of these things here is worth a shot. We we could we could put it on the you know either either on the do you have any do you have this pine rock in the guy by chance? If it's if it's nobody's if you if you don't have one, we wouldn't mind giving it to you. Oh there's pale berry season here too. Can put some of this stuff back in there. You want to pass the pine rockland guy? That's a cool starter guy for a lot of the pine rockland, uh, pine rockland plants. Um, so we can get on to our main event. Thanks for waiting, guys. So I'd like to introduce our speaker. So David, while you set up with this, I can introduce you. All right. Thank you. So David Fine has taken citizen science to the extreme. He has been serving the moths of the Florida Keys since 2002 and has identified over 630 species of moths just from Monroe County, including a few species that have never been seen before and publishes findings on the website keysmoths.com. David specializes in documenting life cycles of butterflies and moths of Florida by way of photograph as well as video and has a, a growing YouTube channel highlighting his Lepidoptera adventures in Florida and his Keys Moths YouTube channel. He currently sits as the chairman of the board of the Southern Lep Lepidoptera Society, an organization that specializes in the advancement of knowledge of Lepidoptera in Southeastern USA. If, thanks for being here. All right. Here. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm using, using the arrows? Yeah. Let's see. Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. And where, where am I looking for the camera live stream? Is it just here? Uh, there's no camera, it's just audio. It's like, just they're audio. Seeing, they're seeing this. The presentation. Seeing okay. Shit. Just want to make sure I understood. No Good. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys today. Um, I typically hang out with uh, moth guys. And there's like, if you were all four of us in the southeastern United States get together every, every, week, every year for Moth Week. Um, but I, I've recently known, come to discover that it would really behoove me in my project to hang out with more plant people. Because if you ever see any of my YouTube videos, you know, I'll be like, and look, look at this amazing caterpillar. It's on this plant, you know. So um, 
and here's the thing when it comes to uh the moths of the florida keys and as you'll get to see uh there are some plants that i know and it's because i've loved the moth and then i have to go hunt for what the plant is uh, a lot of you guys are the reverse end and we can we have a symbiotic relationship. We can help each other out. Um, but something that I would love to do, guys, and, and if down here in, um, before I get into my presentation, I want to invite you to collaborate. If, if you are interested in collaborating with me, uh, we, uh, I've come to realize that there has been, um, there's never been a, a long survey or any kind of uh, substantial survey of the moth species of the Florida Keys. So back in probably 1999, I started to become uh, aware that there's like, there's no moth guide. There's no moth website. I mean, there's some, there's some good moth websites now, but not specific to South Florida and certainly not the Florida Keys. And th there just wasn't anything. So I'm finding moths that I can't find on the internet. I can't find anywhere. So I decided to ask for permits from the um, Fish and Wildlife and they granted me access to North Key Largo, the, um, the Crocodile Lake National Wildlife Refuge and Key Deer Refuge down in Big Pine Key. And since 2002, I've officially been doing, uh, just putting up lights, putting out bait traps, hunting for caterpillars, wherever I can find. And as um, Brian mentioned that, that we've identified 632 species of moths just from the Florida Keys. And there's usually a, seven to one butterfly or moth to butterfly ratio uh, in any given habitat. So if there, there's been a hundred, about 108 species of butterflies identified from the Florida Keys. So if that ratio is correct, we should anticipate there to be at least a hundred more species that we've not found living in the, in the Florida Keys. And pretty much every time I go down to the Florida Keys, I find, uh, a new species to the to the project and we've gotten probably 40 or 50 new species to the United States that, that have never been found before in continental United States you know they they've been known from Cuba or the Bahamas or the Antilles or Central and South America but haven't been found in the United States and we're, we find that stuff all the time and as was mentioned uh, a number of new species a lot of which are currently in the uh, the DNA you know, that whole process of describing something, which people smarter than me, I, I give it to them to do that. I just go do the fun stuff and go find it. Uh, so my, my point in bringing that all up is uh, if when I'm into host plant uh, rec, you know, uh, affiliation with these species and probably half of our moth species from the Florida Keys, there is zero zero record of any host plants or immature stages or so the caterpillars we have no idea what they look like what they feed on we just know that they they're found in miami-dade and you know monroe county so uh so here's where you can collaborate if you if you're interested you can take down my email address and my phone number uh if you're interested in if you find a caterpillar especially living down here in the keys or or, or south florida dade county um and you say uh, what is this I'm inviting you to email me or text me, and it's david at keysmoths.com. Um, and I'm, I know this is being recorded, so david at keysmoths.com. And against uh, my better judgment, I will give my cell number 561-441-4873. Uh, that's 561-441-4873. Because if you find a caterpillar and you take snap a picture and you can text it to me, I can be out doing whatever I'm doing. And if it's something that I've never seen before, I will text you right back. <laughs> and, and we can, you know, just chat about, hey, what plan is it on? Where, and, and it could be something that is just a, a newly, just newly found, like, oh, that's the host plant. We know we've seen them off a number of times. Uh, it's been found in collections and museums or whatever. But just what does the caterpillar look like? What does the plant look like? And so with your native plant, Thing. This is like a very tightly, uh, this could be a really cool collaboration. And I'd love to make YouTube videos. My, my, my Keys Moths YouTube channel, I, I know some of you have mentioned that you've seen it. Um, uh, I just, I go a lot to the Florida Keys, a lot of time in Broward County, but I do a lot of stuff in North Florida too. And wherever I go, 
I was just in Eleuthera, Bahamas a couple months ago, and we found some cool bugs there. And I, of course, I'm making videos about it. And that's the best way I've found to stimulate public, public education on stuff. So I'm glad you guys are doing YouTube and, um, you know, that I love making YouTube videos. So it's cool to make a YouTube video on a new species. I, I mean, that's, I've done that a few times and, uh, that's, that always gets interesting people to, to comment and, and check it out. So anyway, uh, we're here to talk about plants, uh, and the moths that are attracted to them. And so I'm also, I, I try to be humble. So if I, if I have something that's a plant that's misidentified here, feel free to call me out because I, I'd love to hear more from you on that. Uh, I'm guessing a lot of times I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best on it and I have some plant people, but I need more plant people. And here you are. All right. Gardening for moths in, the, in South Florida. Uh, first, that what was asked was, hey, what is the difference between a butterfly and a moth? You know, you know moths, are, moths are ugly and butterflies are pretty, right? And eh, that's not a difference. Uh, in fact, a lot of moths typically fly at night and butterflies typically fly during the day. But I, t I tend to get quite a few butterfly species at my lights at night. So a lot of times butterflies will come to lights and there's plenty of day flying moths like the faithful beauty that you guys have down here in, um, in Dade County. Um, and so what is an actual difference between a, a, an actual um, difference between a butterfly and a moth, one of the major differences is now they have these cool fuzzy antenna, the moths, some of the moths do, but heterosera means straight antenna. And so a moth will have this antenna here without a club at the end. Some of them have the fuzz, some of them don't. The, the butterfly has that distinctive club at the end of the antenna, which uh, is where the sensory organs are, are, are condensed on that, on the tip of the antenna. Moths are have just they're spread out throughout the antenna um but a butterfly butterflies are actually a subfamily of moths so if you ever really want to get technical butterflies are actually moths anyway so i, I somebody commented on my channel uh last week you keep calling them uh moths they're, they're butterflies i'm like well my channel is keys moths yeah i could do keys butterflies but butterflies are actually moths so you know Go do some taxonomy. All right. One of the differences between butterflies and moths that is not commonly known is that moths can hear and butterflies don't. In fact, uh, this faithful beauty specimen has a, uh, there's a little organ right here, which is the tympanic membrane. And there's, it's kind of blown up there. That's an eardrum for a moth. And they use that for, and if you ever pick up certain moths and handle them like I do sometimes, uh, some, some of them, many of them, little, you hear these little noises that they make. And that, they rub their legs against that, against that hollow thing. and It will actually make a noise as well. And one of the things that is believed that they've developed this is because when they're flying at night, guess, what's, guess what eats moths? bats right and bats hunt by what by sound so it has been observed or at least theorized I'm, I'm, i think it's been observed it's definitely been theorized that moths will use this sound producing thing to create a sound as a as a like a, a decoy sound to to help bats miss them so they can hear the bat with their little chirp and when they hear the bat the moth makes the sound and flies a different way and you know, so that, that's a theory. I, I don't, I have never personally tested that and I don't care much to handle bats. So that's just a guess. All right, moving on. Um, in your garden, oh, we can't see the moths. Well, you can see the caterpillars, but one of the cool things that I have, I live on a street with a sodium um, light, street light. And the cool thing is they don't, the moths don't seem to care at all if the sodium light is on. So... I see moths flying around in my garden all the time in my front yard just because the sodium lights there. It's like they don't even know it's there. So it's a cool, cool way uh, if you wanted to explore that and you wanted to create a moth garden, or you probably already have a moth garden because you have native plants, which is kind of the whole point of this. Uh, putting a sodium light 
of some sort in your, in your garden might provide an opportunity for you to see the moths in their, you know, you know, and you can see the hawk moth or the pink moths come in nectaring. And uh, I have, I've got two big red cedar trees in my front yard. And there's a little geometric moth that eats this, that feeds on the cedar. And the, the, the street light is right here, right, in, right by the, my two cedar trees. And you can just see the moths just flying around the cedar trees all night long. It's just, and it's really cool. So that's a, a neat way that you might be able to uh, actually appreciate the moths that come to your garden. Now, what I want to do is, uh, as, as I said, there's 630 species of moths that we've found in, in the Florida Keys. There's a whole lot more once you get up into the mainland because the plant, you know, the plant life gets more diverse. When the plant life gets more diverse, so does the butterfly and moth life as well. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on some of the bigger, cooler, colorful moths that we might be able to recognize. I kind of geek out on the micro moths too. Um, I'm interested in those just as thing. But uh, one plant that we all know and love is a sea grape, right? Coccolova. And... Let's talk about some of the bugs that feed on this as a larval host plant. Now, I just discovered this this past year at the amethyst hair streak, one of South Florida's most precious and rare butterfly species. Uh, it has long been thought to use the exotic um, lady's tongue tree. What's it called? The, uh, huh? Albizia, yeah. So, so this big um, this tree that's a, that's an exotic. It was thought to use that as a host plant, but we discovered that it actually feeds on sea grape. And when the blooms of the sea grape come out in May and June, you can actually see the amethyst hair streaks. And, and I I found ten colonies of amethyst hair streaks right by my house in like concrete jungle of our town. And it was, it was like two years ago, it was one of the rarest butterflies in the United States. And now I've got 10 colonies within a mile of my house because I know where to look. That's, that's part of the cool thing about it. But this is um, Phaedropsis stigmata is a, is a really, really pretty moth that feeds on the uh, sea grape as well. So that's a very be beautiful moth, about an inch, inch and a half wingspan, uh, feeds on sea grape. Rough velvet sea. Uh, in any of the velvet seeds, this is actually a plant that I'm, I'm looking to get because there's some life cycle work that I want to, I want to do with the velvet seed, the Gatarda group. And this is a really cool one. This is, uh, you, you, you fire hard glossum sagra. It's a Cuban, it's a Cuban, recent Cuban migrant to the United States and it feeds on these, uh, Gatarda elliptica. And I think there's a couple different velvet seeds and I think it'll lead any of them, but uh, it, they like the rough velvet seed. Moth is absolutely stunning. It's, I mean, this is, these are two fresh specimens here. Uh, the males have this, this tuft at the, on the back end and they use that to um, attract the girls with some kind of perfume or something like that. The, the hind wing has a, a, like a bright golden yellow band on it. It's a beautiful moth. It's an absolutely beautiful moth. They can be seen feeding at, um, at um, twilight, like both in the morning and the evenings. Uh, and I've seen them on, let's see, what fly, I've seen them on some of the, uh, what's this? There's a small morning glory with purple, purple morning glory with tiny flowers in the keys. Any, you know what that is? Really tiny purple morning glory. Anyway, um, they feed on, they love nectaring on flowers. So, uh, oh, the, what's the passive, Passiflora that, that lives in the Keys, it's really aromatic. It's got a really sm strong smell, the passion vine. There's maybe, like I said, I'm, I'm not the plant guy, but there's a, plant, there's a, there's a Passiflora in the Keys and the, the, the flowers, when it goes into full bloom, is very ar aromatic. You can smell it. And I, I found these things all over that one time in the keys is pretty cool. Uh, a couple other moth species. This is called the half blind sphinx. Uh, it's got a bright golden band here, uh, also in Miami-Dade County. And the streaked calidota is a tiger moth. Feed on the velvet seed. And those are all really, really cool moths. Um, very, very few people have ever, ever seen them.
unless you're a nerd like me. All right, quail berry. I'm, I'm looking to get some quail berry too. So if, uh, I will take suggestions on where to get some of this stuff. Uh, if there's any nurseries, native plant nurseries down here. Uh, there are two really neat moths in, in South Florida that feed on quail berry. Here's another sphinx moth, uh, the tantalus sphinx, it, alopius tantalus. There are th three species of alopius that, uh, that live in South Florida. This is the most common one, and it feeds on a number of different things across the petalum. It feeds on, uh, what, seven-year apple. Uh, a, a few other species of plants and, and can be seen. It's a day flying sphinx moth that, that comes to a multiple, a, a lot of different types of flowers. This one here now, this is a very special moth. Pseudocarus minima, the lesser wasp moth. Uh, the caterpillar feeds on the quail berry. It, it lives only on the pine rocklands. Um, they can be found in Big Pine Key, down in the lower keys. And I found them uh, in several areas in Miami-Dade County, and they feed on the quail berry. And it's a really cool, I mean, it's a day flying moth. It's tiny, it's half inch wingspan. And they eat, um, the caterpillars feed on that, on that plant. Pretty cool thing. Uh, so this is the caterpillar for the sphinx. And there's a green form and a brown form. And they are, they're beautiful, love them. And guys, if anybody has a question or something, I'm Italian. We interrupt each other, just a normal conversation. So please raise your hand. Say, hey, I have a question. I'd be happy to, to answer any question you might have. Uh, wild grapes, or this one is the uh, Sissus. I don't know. if you, Anybody ever seen that bug? I love the gaudy sphinx. <laughs> so there's a, there's a number of big sphinx moths that feed on the Sissus. And Virginia creeper, cissus, uh, muscadine grape, possum grape, they, this stuff. This is, the caterpillar for this moth here has these big fake eyes on the thorax. And when you disturb the caterpillar, it flares out its, like the, its skin. It actually makes it look like a, a head of a viper. It's really, really neat how it does that. It's big, too. It's a big, big caterpillar. Um, there's several other species. This is the vine sphinx. Very, very rare, but they do occur in Florida. Uh, um, we have the great leaf skeletonizer moth, which is a tiny wasp mimic about this big. And then the mournful sphinx, uh, annual lugubris, which they all feed on great species. Love them. Crabwood. You guys like crabwood, right? Yeah. So a couple of the bugs that we can get on crabwood, obviously your Florida purple wing, and, um, and the yellow sphinx. Now, the yellow sphinx is polyphagous. It feeds on all kinds of different things, but it loves euphorbs. Um, I found them on papaya. Find, uh, now, we'll, we'll, we'll go over that a little, little bit here. Um, Alamanda, poinsettias. They have uh, the, the, the yellow sphinx caterpillar, which is right here. Uh, it's got like this really neat little cyclops eye on its back. Uh, and, and it hides the eye, the caterpillar does. It's not a real eye, it's a marking. But it hides the eye in, in between these skin folds up here on the thorax. And when you disturb the caterpillar, it, it, it puts its head down and it, and it exposes this big eye in an attempt to uh, thwart predators. So, huh? Yeah, I see you. Yeah, I see you. Pick a move. So yeah, it's a, it's a great bug. Also on Alamanda and anything in the dog bane family, uh, we have two of these uh, day flying wasp moths that are native to Florida, an orange one. And of course, I know you guys don't plant oleander, right? You do. All right, we got some oleander people, but they tear that up, right? Um, and the, the polka dot wasp moth will eat a lot of different plants in the dog bane family. Uh, that, well, I've never tried to eat one. Yeah. Yeah. So the, so I would believe, I believe so. Yeah. And they're very showy. Even if the, anybody seen a faithful beauty moth? Yeah. So the faithful beauty has, uh, they store toxins from the plants that they eat and uh, faithful beauty. Actually, if you it's yellow, 
the froth from its head, from right, right, land right behind its head, and it smells and it stains. And then I've never, like I said, I've never tasted it, but I would imagine you don't want to. <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah, so they are toxic. This whole family tends to be just that. Now, um, I found the Elo Sphinx also on wax myrtle, which also happens to be the host plant for the imperial moth, one of our larger saturnid or silk moths. And, um, you know, having wax myrtle um, in your yard is a, is a cool thing. I found the uh, Elo Sphinx several times on the wax myrtle. And uh, here's the, this is the caterpillar for the uh, imperial moth, the big yellow imperial moth. And these are immature caterpillars of the Elo Sphinx. This two of them there. And uh, those are on my dad's, my dad has a crown of thorn uh, plant. It's also U4, I think. Okay. All right. Now, staying in the u forbs. Uh, if you if you've planted plumeria ever, you may have may or may not have found these big five six inch long, uh, incredibly beautiful and colored caterpillars devour your entire tree. Um, this is Pseudosphinx tetrio, the the tetrio sphinx moth. It's one of our largest moths in in Florida, and it feeds. It, well, it's known to feed on the frangipani tree, but it eats uh, dog vein family plants uh, in the, in the, in wild. So, uh, but it, it, it's very grateful for the big, pretty flowered flowering trees that we put up because the caterpillars tear it up. And, and I, I, when I used to, I used to work at butterfly world up in Broward County I used to manage their laboratory and probably every August, usually August, September, we would get a number of phone calls, people frantic, these big black and yellow caterpillars are eating all my fringe of penny leaves. Like, Okay, we'll be right there. <laughs> we'll come get them and show them off to people. Uh, but it's um, they eat themselves out of house and home. All right, Echites. We have our devil's claw, and some of you know what's coming. Uh, we have our faithful beauty. This vine grows in the uh, pine rocklands and in the hardwood hammocks. And the uh, the faithful beauty is it's it's actually my mascot for my my uh, YouTube channel. And so if you want to take a closer look at that. It's, creatures man it's they're, they're absolutely amazing uh the caterpillar is equally as impressive it's got a bright like pinkish red color with purple um they're they're absolutely stunning and the, the faithful beauty is very you know it's like it, it's it's gorgeous and it knows it that like shows off its colors i i, I guarantee it's poison is toxic to eat uh because it doesn't seem too concerned about um being eaten it's pretty slow lazy flight now this moth here also feeds on plants in the euphorb family. Um, it, the host plant in the keys is unknown. And it's, it's very, uh, there's, it's only known by several specimens. It's this uh, Palpita phlegia. It's about a two inch wingspan moth. And it's, it's only known by a few specimens for 20 something years. I've only seen two. Know, it's assumed that it's a real rare moth. But my buddy who lives in Boca Raton has a lucky nut tree. And about three times a year, his tree just gets completely devoured by these caterpillars. And he was going to cut it down. And one day he asked me, Dave, can you come and see what these caterpillars are? They're, they're eating my tree. And he, he sent me a picture and I didn't, I didn't recognize the caterpillar. So I was like, I'll be right there. So I come on over and we rear it out. And what is it? It's this moth that almost is ever seen. But he hates them because thousands of them, and it probably is just one moth, one female lays, you know, a couple hundred eggs, and the caterpillars devour his lucky nut tree, and he got really upset. So um, anyway, I, I think it's pretty close to oleander in that same group. I, I'm not sure, but uh, what what is, it, what is this moth eating in nature? Uh, that would be I don't know if anybody has any educated guesses based on what was it uh Thavidia is the lucky nut genus what's closest to that in our area i don't know so you can help if you find <laughs> caterpillars all right we got white vine um 
White vine is a, um, a milkweed species that, that we obviously know the butterflies that, uh, that feed on it, but there are four sphinx moth species that also use white vine as a larval host plant. And of course, the, uh, our queen and soldier butterflies as well. And, um, you know, you find that on canal banks and, so, and stuff. And it's kind of, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not the prettiest plant, but boy, the butterflies, the, the, the flowers are great for nectar. And the, there's all of these caterpillars for butterflies and moths that, that eat it. And, you know, it's a great plant. You know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I have not, I have not heard that they do, but I don't know. They might, I'm not sure. So that's, a, that's actually a good question. Morning glory. Um, there's a couple cool bugs that eat morning glory. This big pink spotted hawk moth is, uh, it, uh, well, they, they eat potatoes, but they, they also eat morning glory. <laughs> Yeah, they, yep, yep, exactly. So, um, so they, the, the caterpillars can be found on, on sweet potatoes, but they, they eat morning glory in the wild. And uh, there's this little brown guy over here, uh, the, the morning glory prominent that eats morning glory as well. And then there's this railroad vine thing that uh, has a really neat discovery. This moth right here, is one that we found on, in the lower keys that has only been ever been recorded in Cuba. And we found a call, we actually found two colonies, one on, Be one on Bahia Honda Key, one on Big Pine Key. And um, they're obviously, we, have, we just found the moth at our lights. We have no idea what it feeds on. And I, there, I got a guy in Cuba who does lepidopter research and he's like, oh, I know what that is. It, it feeds on this plant right here, railroad vine. So you never know what's going to show up. Uh, when we have these these certain plants, and then um, there's the the yellow yellow banded wasp moth over there also feeds on Ipomea species, and um, they're beautiful day flying moths. They're great. Poison wood. Can stuff actually eat poison wood? Well, yes, it can. <laughs> so the the streaked sphinx, Protambulus stragilis, uh, is is actually one of our more common uh, sphinx moths, and it's a large moth. It's probably a wingspan of four, four and a half, five inches. And uh, they have, uh, the moth has two, two forms. It's got an orange form and it's got a red form. The hind wing can be brick red or, or orange. And the caterpillars feed on poison wood. And um, they also eat Brazilian pepper. So that's, that's why, it, that's the Brazilian pepper thing has helped spread the range of this moth all the way up through, uh, I think Georgia now. But um, but if you go down to the keys, and by the way, if anybody wants to, there's um, I've got some videos on my YouTube channel. I've got a UV beast flashlight, like with one of these black light flashlights. You can go out at night with your UV beast and just look around. And most green caterpillars glow iridescent colors under UV light. So you can actually hunt for caterpillars much more easily at night with the UV flashlight. Uh, it's a pretty neat little tool to have in your pocket. You know, it's pretty cool. Um, this is actually, this is a, a, a caterpillar. I don't have it pictured, but it's a, another prominent moth, a brown moth. Uh, it feeds on poison wood as well. It's only in the Florida Keys. And it is one of those things I, I discovered the host plant um, of, this, of this moth. We would only know the moth in the Florida Keys, a little brown, a brown moth about two inches long. Uh, and I was, I had my UV beast flashlight and I was looking around and I saw this thing light up and green and it was on poison wood. So yes, I took it home. Yes, I got blisters on my arms and hands, but I raised it through and I, I was faithful to my cause and found out. And, and what they do is actually, they'll, um, They'll chew the vein of the of the leaf to bleed it. So they'll bleed the leaf first, and then they'll start eating the leaf to keep the toxins from being ingested. So monarchs do the same thing, by the way. Okay, so you ever see a monarch? They'll they'll chew through the vein of the leaf, and the milk will start pouring out, and then they'll go and eat the leaf. 
Uh, they're smart, I guess. Pretty cool. All right, Strangler Fig. There's a number of really cool bugs that feed on Strangler Fig. Um, this is our second largest sphinx in Florida, in the United States, actually. It's, it's the ficus sphinx. Um, they love Benjaminus too, but uh, you know we we love our our natives. So uh, <laughs> so, so uh, ficus aria is uh, it's a great plant for it. But you know how do you find your caterpillar when it's up 40, 50 feet up in the tree? That's the problem. Uh, that's why the the best time to find these is when they go and make their their pupa. They they turn colors. They turn from this green color and they turn kind of a reddish brown color come down and they crawl around on the ground. That's when people find them when they're looking for a place to dig in the ground and make their, make their pupa. But there's an entire family of moths that feed on ficus that um, they're the most stunning moths in all the, in, 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 in all the world. This one is called Hemorophilia diva. It's, it, 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 it's goddess. It really is. It, it's got iridescent colors of all of every color. It's got iridescent green, yellow, purple, blue, orange. No iridescent red, but it has structural red on, on the uh, on the forewings, and then on the hind wings are structural orange. Uh, even even the the antenna have uh, iridescent silver. It's an incredible moth. Uh, the caterpillars, but it's tiny. It's a quarter inch wingspan. Uh, so if this thing was a two, inch, two inches long, everybody in the world would know about it. It's an incredible moth. Uh, this one's a little bit more common. It's a same family, Tortyra slasonia. Uh, also has like iridescent, like copper color. It's really, really, really pretty. Pretty moths. There's, there's four of them, and they all feed on ficus. Okay, and of course we have our, our ruddy dagger wing butterfly that eats ficus, and uh, and this one here is the. The Edwards wasp moth uh, also feeds on ficus. And if you have a strangler fig tree, who's ever seen the little fuzzy cocoons that, that, that they make? You ever see those? You ever walk at a nature center and they have all these little fuzzy co cocoons up on the, under the awnings of the, of, of the, you know, those are those moths right there. And at, probably three or four years ago, there was, a, there was some kind of really strange... Um, uh, population explosion of this moth and all the strangler fig trees got defoliated down the Florida Keys. I mean, like there was no strangler fig leaves on any, does anybody remember that? It was, it was really interesting. Like talking 40, 50 foot tall trees with zero leaves on them. There was thousands and thousands, maybe millions, millions of moths. It's pretty interesting. Okay. Spider lilies. Um, I don't, I don't know which one is the, which ones are native and which ones aren't, but there's a really neat moth called the Spanish moth. And uh, their caterpillars are also very colorful. They're black and white stripes, and they feed on the, uh, the leaves of the, of the spider lilies. It's pretty cool. All right, Anona, the pond apple. It's one of my faves. The giant sphinx, the largest moth in um, in North America, as far as wingspan, up to, wingspan up to 11 inches. Beast. The thing's a beast. Uh, and it has a proboscis. The proboscis of this moth is t 9 to 10 inches long. So, it, it, like, I have a video where, you know, you take a, I have a little, you know how the proboscis curls up, and you, you, I put, like, my, my forceps through the middle of it, and I just extend it out. And the proboscis extends out, you know, 10, 11 inches. It's really cool. Uh, they, they will nectar on deep-throated things. And we were talking earlier about uh, the ghost orchid. Somebody put up, set up a video camera and found out that this, um, this moth nectars on ghost orchids. Um, and, uh, but they, they eat a lot of things. They, they eat, I've seen them nectaring on orchid trees, uh, the flowers of orchid trees. And so like the angel's trumpet, they, they come up underneath the big trumpet flower flower and stick their proboscis up into the flower and, and take nectar from that. Pretty cool. There, it, there's, um, there are three species of fruit piercing moths. This is Gonadonna nutrix. That's Gonadonna biden. This, one's, this is an extremely rare moth. 
um, that lives only in Dade County and Monroe County. Uh, they also feed on the uh, Anona species and the keys. Uh, there's a third species that we discovered in, in, in Largo. It's, I think it's only, only been found twice. So um, they all feed on Anonas. So love them. And they, they actually will also eat uh, sugar apple. Yeah. So I, I, I like a two for one. Anybody? Yeah, I like a two for one. Uh, so I have a sugar apple tree in my yard and every now and then we'll get um, caterpillars for these, these species uh, in my yard in Broward County. So it's pretty cool. But I know sugar apple is not native. Sorry. <laughs> um, Florida trema. <laughs> Excuse me. Florida trema is a, a great plant, uh, native plant. And it has a couple cool critters that are, will host on it. Marshall scrub hair streak. Uh, is a uh, butterfly that is, is pretty, you know, it's pretty hard to find butterfly, but they will find that uh, Florida trema and the lay eggs on the blooms and the caterpillars will eat the uh, developing flower bloom blossoms. And this moth is Halicidota syncopes. That's a tiger moth. And uh, the caterpillar is really, really cool. It's got like this Native American headdress thing looking thing going on uh, with the, with the hair. Uh, interesting thing about this moth, I, I, of course, I found caterpillars one day and I, I raised them through. And then the caterpillars, when, when they make their chrysalis, the, all the hairs that they have, they, they take the hairs and somehow it, it, it wraps the chrysalis the hairs from, from the caterpillar. And the, the, the ends of the hairs that go into the skin of the caterpillar, have these little barbs. And when you touch the, the cocoon, the barbs stick into your skin and the hair is actually like, like porcupine barbs. A lot smaller, a lot less painful, but you have to pluck them out one by one. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Interesting critters, huh? Uh, black mangrove. If we can garden that somehow, pretty cool. Obviously, we have our mangrove buckeye. Uh, down here, but also the false window sphinx, uh, Matarix pseudothyrus it is a, a, a moth that feeds on black mangrove. Pretty cool. Firebush. Yay, firebush. Everybody loves that. Uh, we've got two moths that the, the caterpillars feed on the leaves of the firebush. And we've got the Pluto sphinx, which is this bright green one with the yellow hind wings. And this is a Zelophanes tursa is the is a very common and widespread moth. Pluto sphinx is not so common and widespread. It's common down here because of all the firebush, but um, tursa goes all the way up into almost into Canada. So yeah, and the the caterpillars of tursa will eat a lot of different things, including you know your pentas, the leaves of your penta penta uh, flowers. Delbergia, coin vine. Uh, obviously, we have our um, Statira sulfur butterfly that feeds on your coin vines. But there's also two really cool. Th this moth right here is a very rare moth. Um, but I found a caterpillar on a coin vine once. Didn't know what it was. Popped it in a jar and fed it until it popped out. And that's what came out. Same thing with this Omoides semialis. Uh, just you never see this moth unless there's coin vine around. So it's pretty cool. Jamaican caper. Um, we have our Florida white butterfly that feeds on larval host plant Jamaican caper. But then we have two moths that are, they're both very, very, uh, Dicagrama top and Dicagrama amabilis on the bottom. It's like this satin white moth with pink spots on the tips of its wings. It's pretty cool. And I don't know. I always thought that looked like angel wings or something like that on the thorax of the, of the one on top. But two very pretty moths. That um, This one has come to lights quite often. The, the, this red and baccarat comes to lights quite often. I've not seen the white one at lights. But I have a Jamaican caper in my yard, and the, the caterpillars roll the leaves up, 
and I raised them out and that's what popped out the cocoon. So I was pretty jacked about that. Wild coffee. Now, um, this one's new. Uh, we discovered this Sphinx moth just in the last couple of years in, uh, it's common throughout Central America and the Caribbean, uh, but the host plant is believed to be wild coffee. And so if you have wild coffee in your yard, keep an eye out because you might get a cool image of a caterpillar, Sphinx caterpillar, uh, that would be like a first time thing um, in North America. But we're waiting. I'm looking on my wild coffees. I'm trying to open to see the caterpillar for that one day. Uh, and then this little moth here, the mournful desmia, also feeds on wild coffee. They're the caterpillars that curl up the leaves. If you, if you have wild coffee, they, they curl up the leaves and they make like a little coffee cigar. <laughs> And, and inside is the, uh, is the caterpillar. All right, milkberry. Was it Chiococa alba? Uh, this is Groat's Sphinx. It's the smallest Sphinx moth in North America. It's the wingspan's a little bit more than an inch. Uh, and for a Sphinx moth, that's really, really tiny. And we only have that down here in Dade County and the Florida Keys. It's actually a very common moth. Um, so pretty cool thing. Tamarin, Lysoloma. Okay, we've got uh, our, uh, our large orange sulfur, Cassius blues, our butterflies that eat tamarind as larval host plants, but also our black witch. So we, yeah, we've, we've all seen the black witch, right? It, yeah, they're, they're fun. Um, black witch are polyphagous. They'll eat a number of different trees in the uh, legumous trees. Uh, I know they love uh, cassias. Um, though they'll eat cassias too, but the acacias. So if you like pineland acacia, they like that, but they love tamarind. They'll eat um, cat's claw. Uh, I think I've seen them on um, a few different plants, but uh, tamarind's the main one. Like the, the, the caterpillars for the black witch, it's like probably four, four or five inch long. Uh, inchworm. It's like a four inch inchworm, <laughs> four inch inchworm. It's kind of interesting. But they, they, they go up at, at uh, night to feed on the leaves. And during the daytime, they, they crawl down to the bottom of the plant and they'll, they'll rest like camouflage against the bark of the tree. And they'll just sit there during the day. They, they go up and feed at night. It's pretty cool. Jamaican dogwood, Pisidia is our host plant for a couple butterflies. We have our fulvous hair streak and our hammock skipper butterfly. Um, both, both use that as a larval host plant, but also our Florida Keys subspecies of the io moth. And so the, the our io moth that lives, and I don't know why, in the Florida Keys, they, they have a very different color pattern than the io moths on the mainland. So the, the Florida Keys male has this like really rust colored thing going on where the ones on the mainland are yellow. And then, and the spot, the eye spots on the Florida Keys subspecies are much smaller. The, the, on the mainland, these eye spots will come out a lot further. These eyes will be a lot big on the mainland species. So it's a pretty interesting thing, but the, the most frequent plant that I've found the Jamaican dogwood, but I mean, they eat palms, they eat uh, red. I found them on red mangrove. Um, I found them on um, uh, lignum vitae, all, all, all kinds of different things. So they are polyphagous, but they sure do love uh, Jamaican dogwood. And that's the end of our presentation. So, yeah. Thank you. And so that, that was kind of like rapid fire, uh, and, you know, but we got to keep it moving because I can put anybody to sleep. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, questions? That's an IO moth. It sure, it sure does. It's a Kendall, Kendall subspecies. Yeah, that's pretty. front yard okay yeah yeah well who, who knows it was on our 
on the driveway. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like it's a very fresh specimen. So it looks like it just emerged, but it, it, it if you can see it's um, the, the coloration on the, let me see if I can go back and find it real quick at the end here. Uh, let's see. Okay. The, uh, the coloration on the Florida Keys one, it's got like a really deep rusty color. Whereas uh, the ones up here, they're, they're, there's a lot more yellow in it. And so it's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, but that's a beautiful moth. So, you, you, yeah, yeah. So I've, I've had a couple of friends who had run in with another moth caterpillar. Yep. That wasn't so fun, but it's just a moth. Oh, yeah. You ever, you ever had run into them? I have. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I try not to run into them. But uh, yeah, I have a friend, the, the tussock moth, or what do we say? We have um, the pus moth, right? So the real fuzzy one, they eat palms and stuff like that. The, the, the moth is actually kind of cute, little fuzzy, cute little yellow moth. But the, the pus moth caterpillar uh, has underneath that fuzz is like three branches of spines that like one that like goes right up off the dorsum and one off of each side. And if you touch those spines and it, it, it will nail you, man, it's uh, actually my, my friend actually started to have chest pain, went to the hospital because he, he, he was on a park bench and he kind of rested his arm on a table and it was there and he, it hit him and it swelled up really good. Yep. Yep, for sure. If I'm not mistaken, I think they also go for oaks and mahogany. So that's, that's why you sometimes see the park benches underneath those trees in the shade. Yep. That's, that's the perfect place for them. Hey, I'll go hang out there. So yeah, that's good. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Yeah, not harmful. Um, but th that one's actually pretty cool. So that moth, it, it, I have a picture of it on the website. The female doesn't have wings. So, so the tussock moths with the, the, the cool hairs that come off and the little fuzzy things that stick, stick off the back. North Florida is loaded with those. They eat oaks, you know, under a big oak tree. Yeah, so they, they love oak trees. Um, so when the females emerge, or the males emerge, they're brown. The females emerge, and it's literally this big, white, fuzzy abdomen that, with legs, and it just walks around. And, and it, it will release a uh, pheromone. The, the, the boys come and, and they do their thing. And then she just lays eggs wherever she's from, wherever, whatever tree she's on. And, uh, and that's, that's very interesting. So how do they, so that tree becomes the, the only place where this creature lives because the female can't fly from tree to tree. So that's, that's kind of interesting. It just lays eggs right where on the same tree where it grew up. It's kind of cool. Fiddlewood. Fiddlewood. I, I'm unfamiliar with what fiddlewood is, so I would have to... Uh, it's a tree, huh? Hammock tree? I, I'll tell you what. Next time you have uh, fiddlewood pests, give me a holler, and I'll... Oh, <laughs> huh. Okay. Defoliated. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I. I I, I I haven't I haven't gotten the chance to raise that one yet. That's that's interesting. Yes, sir. Oh yeah, that would be great.
Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah, so moths that, let's see, they love male papaya trees. So the, the blooms of male papayas that they, they love, sphinx moths love those. Um, help me out. I, I, there, there's a vine that grow bush a woody vine that grows and it comes up in the in the winter and it and it blooms with these little I used to call it eupatorium. It has uh, this little fuzzy whitish blue flowers right only between Christmas and New Year. And yeah, you know what you know what I'm talking about. No, it's no, it's not that one. it's not that one. Okay. Yeah. So, so there's a there's a there's a plant that I've that it's it's a it's a weed. It grows everywhere, and it and it gets pretty bushy, and the 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 flowers push out, and I, and I can't remember they changed the name. It used to be Eupatorium odoratum, huh? Yes. What what's it called? Chromolena. Yeah. So so that plant is there a common name? Jack in the bush. Okay. So Jack in the bush. It's a great plant. Uh, I, I've I've caught some really. In fact, there's a sphinx moth that uh, called Olypius Titan. Um, it looks like Olypius um, uh, Tantalus, the one that feeds on the seven year apple and the cross of petalum and that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's a little larger, and it's only been found in Florida a couple times, and I found it nectaring on that stuff. So it's a pretty cool, cool plant. But yeah, I'd say, uh, what else? Um, cat's claw, like any, any of the, the little fuzzy white um, uh, legumes, flowers, that they, they like that stuff. They like any of the aromatic uh, any little white aromatic flowers, they, they, t they tend to like those. So very good. Bleeding heart. Bleeding heart. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a larva that feeds on that. I forget which one it is, but that's more of a Northern thing. I think they'll grow down here. Yes. They will grow down here. Yeah. Yes. I, I forget. There, there is at least one that the caterpillar feeds on it. Yeah. Yeah. It could be, it could even be the, um, the pink spotted hawk moth. I, it might be the hawk moth. Great. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Very good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the ficus. Oh, that's that's a great one. So that's it, it just emerged and it's drying its wings. So cool. Yeah. Oh, good for you. That's great. You're a natural. She's a natural. <laughs> The chrysalis, yeah. But do moths usually, uh, are they usually hanging off of, of plant material? Or I, I've seen a lot of them buried. Yeah. Them. Yeah, mo so most moths, when they pupate, either pupate in, in the dirt or in leaf litter. Uh, the, the black mangrove uh, uh, sphinx that I showed you, the false window sphinx, they actually make a tent with the, in, in the plant with, with leaves and they'll silk the leaves together and, and pupate right inside of the, 
uh, inside the, and a lot of moths will do that as well. So like a lot of our silk moths, they'll, they'll, they'll do that. There's, um, some, some moths will actually take, they'll actually cut little pieces of the leaves and, and silk the little pieces together over the top of themselves. And then the, then the, the little pieces of the leaves, they dry out and it makes like a really neat little crusty shell, but they, they leave a little opening that when they hatch or when they emerge from the cocoon, they, they're able to squeeze their way out. It's pretty neat. So, yes, sir. Uh, so it takes several days for them to complete the pupation process. So like once a, once a caterpillar gets uh, it's a certain, after the fifth instar, there's a hormone that starts to get produced, an adult hormone. Once that adult hormone gets produced, the caterpillar stops eating. They'll, they'll expel their gut. So anything that's in their gut that's being in the middle of digesting this, they spit it all out. And then they'll go and find a place and they start webbing the uh, silk and cocoon or burying themselves. And that takes two, up to two days. So that's a process. Um, well, yeah, that's a good question. So that's a, that's a fascinating thing how, yeah. So, so the typical butterfly chrysalis is anywhere between 11 and 14 days typically. Right. But the shall swallowtail has been known to stay in the chrysalis for seven years. It doesn't want to wake up. Well, because they fly during the month of May. Right. So if, if, if it's been a drought year and the torch wood hasn't put out new leaves, it would make no sense for them to pop out mate and then not have a place to lay their eggs. So somehow they're intertwined very much with rainfall, precipitation or other environmental factors. And they instinctively know, okay, time to wake up and they come out. And it's at the same time when their plant is putting out new growth because the baby little caterpillars can't chew on older leaves. They have to use the little tender new leaflets. Yeah. So then that's most species will do that. So uh, how long do they stay in the cocoon or the chrysalis? Uh, it varies. If, if we have a nice wet season going on, it, it will be two weeks, three weeks. Um, but sometimes uh, like silk moths can drive you crazy. It's like, if I have a, um, if I have a, uh, a brood of like some, some silk moth cocoons and I want to try and breed them again, you just put a male and a female in a cage and it's, you know, you don't have to play any Marvin Gaye or candlelights or nothing, man, just right to do it. Um, but you know, it's very easy. Same thing with the faithful beauty. So I've reared, I've reared three or four generations of the faithful beauty moth. You put a male and a female in a cage together and they do their thing and she's laying eggs within a couple hours. But how do you know when, how do you know when they are going to emerge? Well, you have silk moths and one will pop out. I was like, oh, I got a female. Okay, great. So she'll just sit there and she'll emit her pheromone. And then you're waiting for the boys to pop out. And they don't come day after day after day. And so, so then I eventually like let her go. Just, or I'll let her out and just do her thing outside. Um, because there's no telling when the other ones are going to pop out. So sometimes we can, if we're really getting scientific, we can actually put them, not so much the tropical stuff, but the temperate stuff. I'll put them in the refrigerator for a couple weeks and then pull them out and then start spritzing them with water to stimulate like in, in warmer temperatures, precipitation to, to, kind of like trick them into, oh, it's spring. And then they'll pop out with more regularity. Uh, we do the same thing with swallowtail chrysalis. Uh, so if you want swallowtails to emerge, you know, like a, even giant swallowtail caterpillars, like, you know, you never know when they're going to pop out. So you, we spray the, uh, uh, the chrysalis with, with water, and try to keep them warm. And that way the, uh, they, come, they emerge at the same time so we can keep our culture going. Yeah. So it's pretty, I, I'm actually breeding a hair streak butterfly from central Florida, the, the southern oak hair streak, and the eggs diapause. So the, the females lay eggs on the stems of the oak trees, 
but the new growth is already gone. So the eggs stay all, all winter and it's the eggs that hatch the next year. So I, I now have all of my eggs in a cup and I'm waiting for them to hatch and I was going to put them on, but they didn't, they haven't hatched. Now, all the oak is flushed out new growth and it's like, uh Oh, what do I do? <laughs> so I'm going to try and pop them in the fridge and see if that happens. I'm going to try the same thing with the egg to see if I can stimulate them to, to hatch. So it's pretty cool. Oh yeah, that's fun. All right. Any other questions? Well, I appreciate your time guys. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. Uh, do we have any online questions? Do we have any questions from online? Just a comment. Someone said fascinating. Three exclamation points. Thank you. Three exclamation points. Thank you guys. We're going to be selling the raffle tickets for the next maybe like 15 ish minutes and then go through that. Everyone joining us on YouTube, thanks for joining and have a great night. All right. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.